Alo. Shalom. Rastafarine. 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 This is Brother Wendem Yadon. And we want to respond to a couple of uh, comments, a couple of respondents, um, to the part two of Rastafari and the true light of Hanukkah. Uh, the part two, which is concerning the initiation of the true etymology of the word Hanukkah, initiation disciple and illumination to kingly Christ. Now, the first response we have here from Justin P. 230, Justin P. 2030 or 230. And about, um, <coughs> excuse me, 17 hours ago, he asked, uh, he says, uh, do the black Jews recognize Rastafar I? Question, question. I and I am interested in linking with those Hebrews in Harlem or here in PGH. We have a little question about PGH, perhaps we're missing it, but um, if you can illuminate on that one right there. To learn these Hebrew customs and culture laws. If you can, Aras, Iadonis, or Iadinos, what sources should I and I, brethren, look to? Give thanks for the I, Aras, Tafar, I. Well, give thanks, uh, Justin, Justin P. 230, and our response from Ethiopian World Net about 33 or so minutes ago was uh, the former foundational generation of black Hebrews say from the 1900s recognize Ethiopia or Imperial Ethiopia both in the Bible and historical prophecy. During the 1930s, the black Jews in America and Hebrew blacks did establish active links and contacts with Imperial and Davidic Ethiopia. But the Anglo-Americans and others sought to distract or perhaps redirect um, the tension and divide, subsequently divide and conquer this relationship between Ethiopian Hebrews or the black Jews, the black Jews of Harlem, per se, in the West and Ethiopia with the so-called civil rights movement, where we began to think about the so-called civil rights movement instead of exodus, instead of the real exodus movement. And we see some very important historical um, links, groundations, and foundations of that. Now, you asked about certain sources. Now, we know that a lot of the black Jews, and this is very interesting, and we're actually doing some investigation to, because we were able to come across one, uh, one particular old-timer, um, a brethren of a, a roommate, housemate of a, another brethren who we met recently, who actually, back in the 60s and 70s, when a lot of these movements were, um, in a sense, going through the whole 60s. 60s was a very interesting period of time. We talked about time, quote, end quote, and the 60s, um, because something was, something happened then. In other words, we already won. Actually, we already won from then. But somehow, there's a, you know, there's a lot of these, docu these, these, what they call these kind of shows on TV, like Fringe and some of these shows that put up a kind of a speculative, suppose they found some way to alter time, so forth and so on. And a lot of those things are not just speculative. And we have a couple of other time um, uh, documentaries or lectures on time and concerning the, the inversion of time or something has gone on with time. It seems as though we're in some twilight zone concerning time. But back in the 60s, a lot, there, was a lot, there was a lot of activity in the 60s. In fact, there's the Iron Mountain. If you can, get the Iron Mountain, um, the Iron Mountain DVD. I think it's the Jordan Maxwell DVD. I, I, I think so. And there's a portion in there concerning Kennedy. And when some of the rulers of the world, they was like, we're at a point in time where we're about to enter into a, like a new age of peace. If we enter into this new age of peace, even though it doesn't note his majesty, you have to note his majesty connected with the words and the testimony of um, President uh, John F. Kennedy right there. Now, we point to the 60s because a lot of things, was, a lot of shifts was going on. In fact, it comes up to like 67. And they say 1960, 
67 and going into 68. 68 was the year that changed when the world changed. There's some documentaries out there. I think History Channel talk about it as well. And now when you look at what's going on in the world, it's like we're back to those days again. It's almost like we've returned to that point as well. But concerning the black Jews, many of the black Jews, especially some of the younger generation of, um, of black Jews, um, I call it the younger brethren, you know, uh, I've said somewhat derisively, I say project Jews, but that's only saying that we've come from a situation of great suffering in the ghettos, just like the other, the OJs, the other Jews. And um, there was a lot of breakdown in some of the movements, for example, um, from uh, Rabbi Wentworth Arthur Matthews, who we note in uh, the Gospel of Him, Book One, the Gospel of Him, at near, near towards the end of that first volume, we note some of the foundational black Hebrew and Ethiopian. They were black Hebrews, black Jews, but they were Ethiopianists in their focus because the data, the historical data, was available. So if we would ask ourselves, what is the relationship or lack thereof today of the majority of black Jews or of certain black Jews and Ethiopia vis-a-vis -vis Haile Selassie, part of that is due to the, dissembl the dissemblance and the infiltrators in the movement that sought to divide and conquer us, we hear the diaspora from Ethiopia. And this is why you find a lot of the younger or this generation, certain of this generation of black Hebrews, very antagonistic and dishonorable um, and insulting the dignity of his imperial majesty and trying to sever the links of black Jews or Hebrews in the Americas and the Caribbean from those at home. And then on the other end, with the um, Beta Israel, the Ethiopia, or the black Jews of Ethiopia, also trying to separate them, in a sense, from us. So a lot of divide and conquer is being going, is, has been going on amongst the enemy. And some of the reference material, some of the sources, you asked for some of the sources that we would link. Just, this is just a brief kind of an updated response to it and to give more traction to this issue across the different networks is The Black Jews of Harlem by Howard M. Broach. Broach this particular book here that we had noted in previous videos. And we had read a, some portions from here where, for example, we have this book um, marked where um, Rabbi Wentworth Arthur Matthew is saying on page uh, 1819, there's still copies, used copies of this book, that if you go to some of the booksellers, you might be able to get a copy of this book. Of course, it'll be in print, reprint again. We can't say when, but many of us are trying to work on getting this book in reprint. And if we find, find it, we'll make it available, or we might have to actually try to scan th this particular book or have this book scanned the black Jews of Harlem, because it's important for one to get that historical data. A lot of this is just the historical background and historical data, and a lot of that has been suppressed. So when people say, no, that's not true, I don't agree with it, part of, part of that is due to the fact that a lot of information has been suppressed or misrepresented or twisted or distorted so that blacks would not, black people would not make those links. And if they can keep that information out of the hearts and minds of the lost sheep, then they can potentially keep them in a twilight zone where it's our dawn that's coming, but they're trying to make it seem like it's nighttime. The sun is rising for us, but they're trying to make it seem like it's going down. You know, the whole twilight, the twilight time. If you wake up when it's twilight time, you can't tell whether morning is coming in or whether night is coming in. And they're trying to tell us that it's nighttime, darkness while really it's a new day. This is what the King of Kings has borne witness to. So here on page 18 and 19, just briefly, um, Rabbi Wentworth Arthur Matthew, he says, and the second point is that they are the descendants of the union between King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. This is what the black Hebrews and, and, and the Ethiopian Hebrews, they call themselves Ethiopian Hebrews, they're known as black Hebrews and Hebrew Israelites or black Hebrew Israelites from the 19 teens and 20s and 30s and going all forward to roughly around 
the 60s and 70s. But when we get to the 60s and 70s, the, uh, what we call the political cru crucifixion of his majesty and, and Brother Smyrna Angel, who had made a comment or no, no disrespect, that was a good point. We're going to address that, y'all willing, in perhaps the next vid. We're going to address that. What do we mean by the political crucifixion of Hala Selassie? And give thanks for your comments. But let's just finish this point up right here. So the second point, uh, page 18 of the Black Jews of Harlem, the second point uh, concerning the black Jews, the original black Jews of, of, of the Americas, and particularly North America, the second point is that they are the descendants of the union between King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, who founded a line or a lineage of Ethiopian Hebrew kings from Minulik I, or Kedamawi Minulik, down to Hila Selassie, the Lion of Judah, who is covertly a Hebrew. Who is covertly a Hebrew. Make a, make a note of that. Now, he goes further here. Here's an actual quote from, from the teaching of, the, uh, of our ancestors. I'm saying to the modern black Jews, it's interesting that we agree about the historical data and information concerning us as black people being black Jews or Hebrew Israelites, so forth and so on. But we have to be very cautious of that attempt to divide and conquer us from our black Hebrew peoples in Africa. Not saying all Africans, but the righteous African predominantly are those either Ethiopian Hebrew or those black Africans who are of the he Hebrewish or the Hebraic mentality, liberty, and way of life. All right, let's make that note. But right here it says, of the three sons of Noah, Shem and Ham were black, and only Japheth, the ancestor of the Gentiles, was white. Thus, King Solomon was a black man. After the Queen of Sheba became his wife in a marriage ceremony taking six months, she returned to Ethiopia pregnant with the understanding that the child, if a boy, would be returned to Jerusalem for Bar Mitzvah, or Bar Mitzvah, which is the confirmation. All Hebrew Yiddish terms in both speeches and the narrative are words actually used by the members of the group. This is what Howard Brotz, who wrote this book here, The Black Jews of Harlem, is saying concerning that matter. So as we go further, it says, um, at the age of 12, Minulik, or Bayin Alechem, or Ibn Hakim, or um, Dawit, Dagmawi, Dawit, or David II, at the age of 12, Minulik, the son, did come back and remained in Jerusalem until he was 25. His father, realizing that designs were being made upon the young prince's life, gave him a company of men with whom to go to Ethiopia. Now, the Kibber and the Gass explains the other aspect of this, where our history, where, um, where to go with him to Ethiopia and reestablish or renew the kingdom of David in Ethiopia. That's, that's, that's the purpose of that. And now that fulfills um, Psalm 68, 68, um, 31, as well as other areas of the Psalms in particular, of the Psalm. Know what Christ said concerning the Psalms, where he says, in your law, it, is, it says, I said ye are gods, and that quote came from Psalm 80, 82, 82, and um, I think 82 and 7, but in Psalm 87, it also mentions Ethiopia, this man was born there. So let's make a note of that, that these things were already said from such a time, from Davidic time or thereabout, and now we're seeing in and through Haile Selassie and that righteous Ethiopia, we see that obvious link. And then it would explain all the, all the persecutions and all the dissemblance and all the war and all the destruction and suppression of our story. This now explains all that we have been witnessing, why this information has not been readily available but has been suppressed or, or dissembled, in other words. Now, the priests, it says, who accompanied the young prince, they say deceived Solomon and carried away with them the original tables or tablets of the law instead of the copy which the king had prepared. Make a note of that. 
that there was a copy of the ark and the tablets that was made during Solomonic times. So when we hear this talk about Ethiopia may sell the ark of the covenant, I said, which ark? How do we, how do we know which, which one is which? And what's, what's all this about? Because there's more than one ark, and every church says an ark. And I'm sure that since the practice of making a copy of it comes from Solomonic times, this was also carried on long, long time ago. So we really have to explore what is the ark, what's the purpose of the ark, and whether we ourselves must create an ark for our church. You understand? And understand the ark technology. That's another, that's another series of teachings and lectures and videos there. But anyway, as we move forward, now after... The Ark of the Covenant, the, tab, the tables, the tablets, the silat of the Hig of the Law of Torah, it says they are to be found this very day at Aksum. They are to be found this very day at Aksum. Menulik the first was the first king of Israel in Ethiopia, or the first Hebrew, Hebrew, confirmed Hebrew king in Ethiopia, from whom Haile Selassie, or Kedemawi Haile Selassie, the Lion of Judah, Moan Besa Zeim and Yehuda, traces his descent or lineage in an unbroken line of 613 kings. And it's interesting that it is um, the rabbi, the black Jew, uh, Jewish or Hebrew, black Hebrew, Ethiopian Hebrew rabbi, Wentworth Arthur Matthew, that's making that link about 613. Now, I know some would say, well, it's 225th king, 225th Christian king. Let's understand there were kings before that. So um, let's um, try to go over this 613 point. I think there's a Kabbalistic interesting point because the 613 laws, commandments, statutes, and judgments is one of the reasons why um, our, our black rabbi or Wentworth Arthur Matthews put 613 there. But let's, let's go forward. It says that Haile Selassie's connection with the, now it says the Coptic church, meaning the church of Egypt, before His Majesty brought the church out of Egypt, is due to, now he says, diplomatic pressure from Britain, which, which requested in 1896 after the ethiopian Italian war that all kings coming to the Ethiopian throne be Coptic Christians. We have to understand the background of that particular point because with, without all the proper data, um, an erroneous um, assumption can be assumed. And many assume that er as though Britain has some control over Ethiopia. And some of the black Jews believe the lie that the Queen of England put Haile Selassie on the throne. And how interesting with the history is that Haile Selassie was emperor and already on the throne before Queen Elizabeth was even queen. So that knocks that point out. But that's just one demonstration of these lies that have been circulated, that just a simple um, review of history and, and, and real story, real evidence would point it out. But just to conclude this portion right here, concerning the black Jews, the real or the true black Jews, black Hebrews, and Haile Selassie, it says, however, the court at Addis Ababa is closed for business on Friday afternoons and all day Saturday. No hosier, hosier speaking of uh, pork, is eaten at his palace. And he follows the falasha Ritual, the Falash or the Beta Israel ritual. Haile Selassie is the present king of the house of Israel. And this is proof that David or David, Dawit, should never lack a black man to sit upon the throne of Israel. Remember what the OJs, other Jews, talk about when they talk about Israel is a state. It's a state as in a statement. You understand? What we're speaking about Ethiopia is a throne is the Davidic monarchy, is the Kal Kidan, is the Benai Barit, is the covenant. When Mussolini overran the country, Haile Selassie stopped at Jerusalem to pray in Hebrew before proceeding to the League of Nations. And we can add on to fulfill another aspect of prophecy right there as well. Now, here's the last line that we're going to quote from this book, but this is significant. Please listen. It says, it is from Addis Ababa that I derive my authority as head of the black Jews in the United States. 
We are Africans. In other words, we are black people, not European, not European Jews, but African or black Jews, and we know that connection right there. Um, or Ethiopian Hebrews. So the final point he makes here is that he derives his authority from Addis Ababa, from the King of Kings, as being the head of the black Jew or the black Hebrew community in the United States. And we are Africans or Ethiopian Hebrews. So when we talk about ourselves being Ethiopian Hebrews, it's not based on something that we're making up or saying today. This book was first printed in 1964. 1964, if we go back to the Commandment Keepers Congregation or the Black Jews of Harlem, that goes back to the 1920s and the 1930s. And we know the link with the whole Garvey, so-called Garveyite movement. But before Wentworth Arthur Matthews, we had Reverend uh, C. Uh, C. W. Crowdy, you understand, who was one of the first, we can say, African-American black men who, as a preacher and a reverend, made that that theological link with the struggles of black people in America and their identity as Hebrews and as the black Hebrews or the biblical Israelites of the Bible. So he's actually much older now in, the, in how do we come down today with this black Hebrew consciousness. And some of the black Jews or the black Hebrews out there, like, you know, some of the more, the younger, the more radical, or some people say the more fanatical ones out there, that part of the story has been, has been um, suppressed or erased from their hearts and minds. And when we look back on this movement here, it's when other brothers in the Jewish, black Jewish, black Hebrew movement felt that uh, Rabbi Wentworth Arthur Matthews wasn't radical enough, and we see what was going on in the 60s and the 70s. So they broke away, you understand? They broke away, and today we have some of the street corner Israelites or some of the brothers out there that are preaching and prophesizing out there that actually come from that breakaway movement from the original connection. So when they disrespect or 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 dishonor and say all uh, indignities against his majesty, Haile Selassie, and cut that connection, we have to trace it back to the root. And, and, and this is the root right here. So we're dealing with the roots. Whether they accept it or reject it, it's up to them. The, the best that we can do is provide the information and say, bro, who is your teacher or leader or, or whatnot? You could say it, it is uh, Yahweh Shai, so forth. Uh, uh, amen, amen, emet, emet. We, we, we over that. But who is the men and the people where you derive before you woke up as an Israelite or black Jew or black Hebrew? Where did you get that from? And this doctrine and teaching, where did that come from? As we trace it back and trace it to its roots, we find this root and we find the connection with Hollis Lodge. So this is a very, this right here is a very, a very good, a very good and an important book. And now some of the half of the story that this book um, presents is actually fulfilled in, a, in another book. And it's this, particular, it's this particular book right here, We the Black Jews. We the Black Jews right here. This particular book right here. We the Black Jews witness to the, quote, white Jewish race, end quote, myth. We the Black Jews. And this is written by um, Yosef Ben Yohanan. This is a Yosef Ben Yohanan book. And because he's such an exhaustive uh, uh, compiler of data, he gives us a lot of data and information. Some of his opinions um, are arguable, you know, on some matters where he gives an opinion. But he gives us a lot of data and a lot of actual references that we can use as king's evidence, you know, as what, what we call the king's evidence or some would say state's evidence, but as the king's evidence in us prosecuting our cause and prosecuting our case so we can finally bring about judgment and true peace on the planet earth and the restoration of the kingdom of the king of kings and his christ so this is the next book that actually goes along with it if you go to our website i think we might have a downloadable uh, a free downloadable copy of this or some other related books as well as this one right here when you speak about books from Babylon to Timbuktu. This is the next particular book as well. And then there's a companion book to this 
from Babylon to Timbuktu, which um, is uh, Valley of the Dry Bones. Valley of the Dry Bones, this is by Rudolf Windsor. This gives more of the historical background from Babylon to Timbuktu, showing that our ancestors have been all over the place. You know saying? This is, happens to be the last place, North America and this North country, where Jeremiah prophecy now says that in times to come, we would come out of this North country. So no longer will we say for our Passover Seder, at Passover time, bless the Yah live, Yah live, Yahai, the Lord liveth who delivered the tribes Israel out of Egypt, but we will say in this time out of the north country. And how interesting most of the gathering of the people is here to Judah, the so-called African-American Negro, here in this north country, including the, the Ethiopians as well, the Ethiopian remnant and diaspora. So these are some of the books that we would recommend. Once again, The Black Jews of Harlem, Howard M. Brotz, um, uh, Yosef Ben Yohannan's We the Black Jews, um, From Babylon to Timbuktu by Rudolf, um, Rudolf R. Windsor, as well as the companion book to this, what we consider the companion book to this, which is um, Valley of the Dry Bones. And there's another book concerning Judah and the captivity of Judah that's on our website on the study page. And a lot of that one can download for free as well. So, so this is a basic foundation. But if you can, the black Jews of Harlem, if we put it together in an order, like a class uh, study order, this will be the foundation right here. And then after the black Jews of Harlem, um, we the black Jews right there. Historically speaking, from Babylon to Timbuktu, if you want to now go before We the Black Jews and the manifestation of that movement to our history, then you would get to uh, from Babylon to Timbuktu. If you want to connect from the uh, uh, time of so-called slavery in America to the present, um, Valley of the Dry Bones. Valley of the Dry Bones by Rudolf R. Windsor is a very good book. Now, we know and we acknowledge there's other books out there um, that also speak to the whole black Jew, uh, Hebrew, Israelite. Um, but if you want to talk about the books that we actually have studied from and find to be most accurate um, in prosecuting our case and the king's evidence, speaking about the king's evidence, these are some of the books that we would suggest. So stay tuned. Give thanks, Justin P. Um, 2.30 for your questions. And once again, to the brothers and the sisters, Shalom Ras Teferi. Wendem Yadin Neng.